So in the local equatorial system, what we had was the R angle and the declination, which were both very good coordinates. And one of them actually doesn't change with time, which was declination. But R angle does, so it sucks. But today we are going to finally get into the coordinate system, which is actually not going to change with time. Kind of. So today we have the right ascension and the declination which we already got. So it's right ascension. So in the local equatorial system, what we had was the celestial equator. Now the celestial equator was a pretty good tool because it enabled us to link all the places on Earth with something common, their latitude. So just by knowing the latitude of a place, we could know that how the stars would look like in that place, the night sky. So that's something pretty successful there. And we also had the two coordinates, which was the R angle and the declination. The declination thankfully stays the same as the Earth rotates, but the R angle doesn't. So we need to fix this. Now, to do this, what better origin should we have now? We already have the celestial equator, which is pretty good and it solved a lot of problems. But what is something more fixed and more stable? Well, this is where the sun comes in. which. We almost kind of forgot. Now another important factor has come into play now, which is the revolution. Now we almost forgot revolution because revolution is an important thing and as earth revolves around the sun, it actually causes the seasons because earth is tilted. So because of the earth's tilt, the earth gets more non-uniform heat and some part of the earth gets more heat than the other and as it revolves around the sun, it causes different seasons throughout the year and that's quite good. But this means that the sun's path in our sky is also quite different than it would have been if there was no tilt at all. But tilt is nothing to worry about because our earth has 23.5 degrees while Uranus has actually about 97 degrees and Venus is 177 degrees, almost opposite. Now this introduces us to the ecliptic, which is a new term. Now, ecliptic is actually the annual path of the sun against the background stars. Now, again, as I told you, the sun in the sky is actually not going to be at the same place throughout the year. It will change. It would be lower towards your horizon if it is the winters and would be higher in the sky if it's summers. So what we can do is that we can measure its path against the background stars. And as the background stars are on the celestial sphere, if you note all these things, you're actually gonna get a good path on the celestial sphere. This path is the ecliptic. However, do not make the mistake of thinking this as the path the sun takes in your sky, because it is actually only for a day. The ecliptic which we measure is actually for throughout the year. Now this is the earth right at the center. This is the celestial equator expanded out and this is the ecliptic which would be naturally angled at 23.5 degrees. Now, it is obvious because it is actually the Earth's tilt which is measured with the plane of Earth's motion around Sun. So what you're essentially looking at right now is our revolution, uh, your year. Because Sun is actually at the positive declination for one half of the year and at the negative for the another half. And this causes winters and summers across all of the different places on the Earth. And these two point of intersections right here are actually the equinoxes, which are the vernal equinox and the autumnal equinox. Now it's the time for things to get interesting because we are gonna take one of these point of intersections as our origin, which is actually the vernal equinox and or the March equinox. Now vernal equinox is actually the position of the sun taken against the background stars on the March equinox. And to be more precise is actually, hey Siri, when is the vernal equinox? It's Friday, August 20th, 2021 in equinox. God damn it. Somewhere around the sunrise or near the March 20. And it's also called the first point of 80s. But vernal equinox again as the earth rotates also wheels across the sky. Which means that it's not a very easy origin to find. But it's definitely better than what we had last time. So yeah, we are ready with everything and it's time to calculate the coordinates. Now this is your celestial sphere, your horizon, ecliptic. And what we need to do now is just make the great circle of the star like we did all the time 
And this time again, we can measure the first coordinate, which you already know. And it's time for that, the declination. So we can measure this angle right here, which the star is actually making right now with the celestial equator. And this is our first coordinate, the declination. So now it's time for the second coordinate and things are going to get interesting because we are now going to mark the vernal equinox. Now it would be somewhere on this line of celestial equator because that was the point of intersection of ecliptor with it. So mark the vernal equinox somewhere and this is your origin. All you need to do now is just measure the arc length of vernal equinox towards the point of intersection of the great circle of the star. But unlike last time, we need to go towards east this time. So this length is actually measured opposite to what we had before and this arc length would be your new coordinate. And it's called the famous right ascension. So there you go. These are the two coordinates of the universal equatorial system. The right ascension and the declination. Now again, right ascension is also measured in the units of time. So what we mark again here would be in the units of time, which is again the same equivalent what we had last time, which was 360 degree equals to 24 hours. But what we have now to make things more further simple is that what we can do is make all of this celestial sphere into grids. By dividing our celestial sphere into grids, what we can have is a simple model which would be similar to the latitudes and longitudes of the Earth. The vernal equinox would just act like the Greenwich Meridian and our equator would simply be our equator. However, the video would be incomplete if we did not test the coordinates of the things like the equinoxes and the solstices. So let's do that. This is our celestial sphere. This is our ecliptic. That is our Earth and the celestial equator. Now this is not your night sky, it's just like seeing Earth from something very far away. So in this we have our ecliptic tilted at 23.5 degrees. So coming to the first one, which would be our equinoxes, obviously the vernal equinox right here would be at 0, 0. Since it is the origin, the right ascension is 0 and the declination is 0 because it intersects the celestial equator. Now, the another equinox which we have right here is the autumnal equinox and with this what we can do is that we can obviously see that its right ascension is somewhere if you just go towards the sun right now, it's actually at the 12 hour. And again its declination would be zero because it's also intersecting the celestial equator. Now both of the solstices here would be actually at the 6 hour and the 18 hour right ascension and the declination would be actually for summer solstices at 23.5 degrees and for the winter solstices at a negative 23.5. Now what we can also observe here right here in the diagram is actually that how the sun's diurnal circles changes throughout the year. Now this is because we already know that the sun's declination changes and as it moves across the ecliptic, what happens is that this declination is actually maximum on the summer solstice, which is positive 23.5 degrees and it's lowest on the uh, winter solstice, which is actually negative 23.5 degrees. Now we can just by drawing the diurnal circle for the three months, for the three times of the year, like the equinox, winter solstice and summer solstice, we can see that how much the diurnal circle of the sun varies in your location. So let's go into the diagram. This is your horizon. That is your celestial equator. And this is your north-south line. Of course, this would be uh, varying depending to your latitude. So now what we can do is just just draw our sun. But where should we place it? It's only the declination what you need to know to draw a diagonal circle. So what we can do now is just uh, for the equinox, we know that the declination is actually zero. So what is going to happen is just the sun is actually just going to follow your celestial equator. And that's pretty simple. But for the summer solstice, you can see that the downer circle will have the declination of 23.5 degrees and the sun would be much higher up in the sky. And again, for the winter months, we can see that the sun is actually much lower in the sky with the declination of uh, minus 23.5 degrees. So this also explains by looking carefully in the diagram that the sun spends most of the time above the horizon in the summer. 
So this means that the days are actually much longer. And again, for the winter months, we can see that the sun spends most of the time below the horizon. So the days are definitely much shorter. We can also see that how the sun would move if this would be on the equator. And you can see that this is you, this is your horizon. And the celestial equator for if you would be on the equator would be intersecting your zenith. This is your celestial equator. Now again, we, we know for the declination, the sun would move actually from your celestial equator, which would be at equinox, to plus 23.5 degrees and minus 23.5 degrees. But another interesting thing to notice right here is that the sun is actually spending equal times above and below the horizon. So basically the days and nights are equal. <laughs> However, you might remember that the stars which never set on your area are actually called the circumpolar stars. However, let's find out what is the condition for the star to be circumpolar in your area. So we have this diagram again, your horizon, celestial sphere and the celestial equator. How low can this star go in your area for it to be circumpolar? Well, actually when it's lowest in the sky, it should be just touching your horizon. That should be the condition of a circumpolar star. So what we can do is that just putting the star at your horizon and this is its diurnal circle, you can see that this should be the declination of the star, which is just 90 minus alpha, where alpha is your latitude. So every star with a declination of 90 minus alpha would become circumpolar in your region, depending on your alpha. For example, if you live on the North Pole, what would happen is that you would be having your latitude at alpha equal to 90 degrees. Uh, and this means that since 90 minus 90 is 0, every star with a declination above 0 would just become circumpolar. And of course, the stars with the negative 90 minus alpha would become invisible in your area, which is all the stars below the declination of 0. However, I did all that to bring out an interesting point which is at what latitude will our sun become circumpolar? Yeah, so now we already have this formula of 90 minus alpha. So what we need to do, since we already know the declination of the sun actually ranges from 23.5 to negative 23.5, we can see that for 90 minus 23.5, this gives us the latitude of 66.5, which is actually the latitude of Arctic and Antarctic circles. This is the place where the sun actually becomes circumpolar. So of course, the higher you go above the 66.5 degrees latitude, the days of the total darkness and the total brightness would become even more extreme with the North Pole going to the six months of light and six months of darkness. Of course, the winters would be even more extreme because there would be no sun and already it's on such a high altitude. So. It's not a climate for everyone. Now this also explains why the day and night difference is also so extreme in different months as we go to the higher latitude. Now you also might have noticed that the stars in the night sky actually move throughout the year. Because you see, we are in the celestial sphere and the celestial sphere is obviously the same. But why would the stars in your night sky change? So that's a topic for another video. And this is it for this one. I hope you guys enjoyed it. You can now finally understand how the coordinates work and happy stargazing. Of course, now you can find them easily. So, <laughs> I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.